Um Sang Saraswati in Namaha, Namaste, Namaste. We're on page 206, the fourth discussion. The paths to attain to God are infinite. In this Kali Yuga, the path of devotion is supreme. Ramakrishna. There are innumerable paths that lead to the ocean of the nectar of immortality. Follow any path that you can to reach the, the ocean of immortality. The goal is to somehow touch a drop of the nectar of immortal bliss to your lips. Whether you dive into that ocean or are pushed in or walk slowly down the stairs into it, the result is the same. If one takes just one drop of the, that ocean of bliss, one becomes immortal. There are many paths leading to that ocean, the path of wisdom, the path of action, and the path of devotion. Whichever path you take, ultimately, you will find God. Those who follow the path of wisdom, Gyan Yoga, discriminate by saying, Neti, Neti, not this, not this. They believe that the supreme divinity alone is real and that the entire perceivable universe is only an illusion. By contemplating the truth alone and denying the illusion of this world, they ultimately attain Nirvikupa Samadhi and thus merge with Brahman, the highest divinity. The followers of the path of action, Karma Yoga, perform every action as an offering to God. All actions thus become a form of yoga and every work leads to union with God. One's work may be that of a teacher, or one may practice meditation and pranayama. That is also work. If a worldly person is able to surrender with devotion the fruits of all of his actions to God, and thus work without attachment to the results of his work, that is called karma yoga. The objective of karma yoga is union with God. In the practice of Bhakti Yoga, the path of devotion to God, one sings the names of God and contemplates his divine qualities and infinite attributes. In this age of darkness, the Kali Yuga, it is the easiest and most recommended path. Union with God through love is the highest ideal of spiritual perfection for this age. It is very difficult to realize God by means of karma yoga alone. Where is the time to do all the prescribed actions? In the Kali Yuga, one's lifespan is very short. Working in the world without attachment or selfishness is very difficult. It is very difficult for one who has not realized God to work in the world and remain free from selfishness. One does not notice how subtly the selfish desires and attachments creep in. It is also very difficult to practice jnana yoga in this time period. All life now depends upon food and all life is short. Attachment to one's body does not leave. Without rising above identification with the body, jnana, wisdom, is impossible. Again, he declares, I am not the body. I have gone beyond hunger and thirst, disease and old age, sorrow and joy, pleasure and pain, birth and death. If our personal experiences of pleasure, pain, disease, etc. remain strong, how can we follow the path of wisdom and become a Gani? <clears throat> If I cut my hand, blood flows, and it hurts very much. A follower of the path of wisdom must say, there is no cut and there is no pain. Nothing has happened to me. Therefore, the paths of karma and jnana are not the ideals for this age. The path of union through love of God, bhakti yoga, is appropriate for this age. Bhakti is the easiest path to attain to God. 
That does not mean that devotees will go to one place and the followers of action and wisdom will go somewhere else. It means that whoever desires realization of the supreme divinity may attain this oneness by means of <coughs> devotion. By means of bhakti yoga, the path of the love of God, one may realize the same divinity that a follower of jnana yoga or karma yoga realizes. A devotee wants to see God with form and desires to have a personal relationship with him to talk to him. A devotee does not desire the knowledge of Brahman, the supreme divinity. The same God is the creator and the fulfiller of all the yogas. My divine mother is supreme. She is the fulfiller of all yogas. When she is pleased, she can grant a devotee whatever he desires. She gives devotion and she also gives wisdom. If you go to Kolkata, you will see all the high society pumped and wealth. The only question is how to get to Kolkata. <laughs> if you find the mother of the universe, you will find both devotion and wisdom. In Bab Samadhi, you will experience her divine form. In Nirvikalpa Samadhi, you will go beyond form and experience Sot Chit Ananda, truth, consciousness, and bliss. Then the I of the devotee disappears into the formless God. Ramakrishna continuing, the devotee says, I have great fear of all these worldly duties. In all this work in the world, selfishness becomes intermingled. Even when I try to act unselfishly, there is still desire for the fruits of the work. It seems impossible to get rid of every last trace of selfishness. If I do perform work with desire, that work will create bondage for me, causing me to forget you. So please reduce my need to work in this world so that I can attain to you. Whatever activities that you give me to do, please bless me that I can perform them without any personal desire. May my every act express only my pure love for you. Please don't increase my worldly duties as long as I have not attained your grace. When you instruct me to do so, I will do your work. And if you don't instruct me, I won't do anything. <laughs> Fifth discussion about pilgrimage and giving spiritual teachings. A pundit asked Ramakrishna how many places of pilgrimage he had visited. Ramakrishna, I saw many places. Ramakrishna then laughingly, but Hasra went further and rose higher. <laughs> he even went to Rishikesh. All began to laugh. I didn't go that far. I can't go that high. The vulture soars very high in the sky, but its gaze is always on what is down below. All laughed again. Below lay attachments and desires. If you can sit in one place and acquire true devotion, then what is the necessity of going on a pilgrimage? I went to Benares, and there I saw the same tamarind trees. If you go on a pilgrimage and fail to acquire true devotion, then the purpose of your trip is unfulfilled. Devotion to God is the purpose and the only real necessity. Do you know the nature of the vulture? There are many kinds of people. Of them, some are filled with pride and speak with big words. <laughs> they say, of all the actions prescribed by the scriptures, I have done many. Their minds are filled with worldly thoughts. 
They are full of selfish attachments, money, name, fame, gain, and comforts of the body. Their minds are very busy contemplating all of these things. Pundit. I agree, sir. Once a man went on a pilgrimage and lost his emerald, but found a diamond. Wow. <laughs> He lost his worldly wealth, but found the jewel of pure devotion, something of much greater value. Ramakrishna, you know, you can give a thousand teachings, but until the time is right, they were, will bear no fruit. A young child was being put to bed by his mother when he said, Mother, when I need to go to the bathroom, please wake me up. <laughs> The mother answered, my child, when you need to go to the bathroom, that need will wake you up all by itself. Don't worry about it at all. You will get up yourself when it is time. All begin to laugh. In the same way, if you have a sincere desire to realize God, everything will happen at the right time. God is a fountain of compassion. There are three kinds of doctors. The average physician examines the patient, prescribes the appropriate medicines and herbs, and then says to the patient, take these medicines, and he leaves. This is the worst kind of doctor. Similar to this, there are many spiritual teachers whose lectures are full of instructions, but they never bother to see if their students are applying the teachings correctly or to good effect. Another kind of physician not only prescribes the medicine, but follows up with the patient to see how the treatment is progressing. If he finds that the patient does not want to take the medicine, the doctor admonishes him and explains the necessity to follow the treatment. This is the middling type of physician. There is a middling type of spiritual teacher as well. This kind of teacher will explain at great length the need to follow the teachings and practices which he has given. Then there is the really great doctor. If such a doctor finds that the patient is not listening to her sweet words, she will use force when necessary. She will even grab the patient by the chest and pour the down medicine down his throat. In the same way, there are great spiritual teachers who, in order to bring their students to God, are authorized to use force if necessary. Pundit. Sir, if one has the company of a great teacher, why doesn't spiritual attainment come of its own accord? Why do you say that wisdom must wait until the proper time? Ramakrishna, that is true, but please consider this. Until the patient has swallowed the medicine, it could fall, fall out of the mouth of a semi-conscious patient. Then what can the doctor do? He can do nothing. The medicine must be swallowed and assimilated by the body before it can have its effect. A teacher must examine the student carefully and then decide what kinds of instructions to give. You see, you don't discriminate between those who you accept as disciples. If a young man comes to me, I ask him first about the state of his family at home. If I find that his father has passed away and that the family is deep in debt, like Narendra, mm -hmm. how can I expect him to give his mind completely to God? He cannot. Are you listening to me? Mm -hmm. Yes, I I'm listening to everything. Ramakrishna. One day, a number of Sikh policemen visited the Kali temple. As they gazed through the entrance into Mother Kali's shrine, one man said, God is the embodiment of compassion. I said, nonsense. 
Why would you say such a thing? They replied, What do you mean, sir? Why do you say that? God is protecting us. He gives us food and shelter. I replied, What wonderful compassion is that? God is the father of all. If the parents do not provide for their children and care for them, who will? Will the other members of the community watch over them? Narendra, then should we not say that God is compassionate? Ramakrishna, did I forbid you from, from saying that? My meaning is that God is our very own. He's not an outsider. Pundit, your words are beyond value. The sixth discussion. Taking leave of Pandit Shashanar. Sri Ramakrishna wanted a glass of water. There was water right beside him, but he said, please bring another glass of water. Later we learned that a person of immoral character had touched the glass from which Ramakrishna would not drink. Pandit Dahasra, you stay with him day and night. You are very blessed. Ramakrishna in a joyful mood. Today was a very enjoyable day. I saw the new moon. Everyone laughs. <laughs> Do you know why I say the new moon? Sita said to the demon Ravan, her abductor, Ravan, you are like the full moon, while my husband Ram is merely like the new moon. Ravan did not understand the real meaning of her statement, so he was extremely happy. What Sita really meant was that Ravan's power had increased as much as it, it, as it could. He had reached his limit. From now on, his moon would wane. Ram, on the other hand, was like a new moon that would continue to wax each day. Sri Ramakrishna now rose, and as he was leaving, everyone offered him their pranams. Pundits, visitors, and devotees all offered their pranams. The seventh discussion. It was now afternoon, and Sri Ramakrishna had returned to Ishan's house along with several devotees. He took a seat in the parlor on the first floor. Present there was a Bhagavat Pandit, as well as Ishan and his children. Ramakrishna laughingly, I said to Pandit Shashadar, you have hardly begun to climb the tree, and you think that you can already reach the fruits? Practice more sadhana and sing more to God, and then you may give your lectures. Ishan, Everyone thinks that he is qualified to teach many people. The firefly believes that it illuminates the whole world, but all it really does is make the darkness seem even darker. Ramakrishna laughing, Shashadar is not merely a pundit. He has some discrimination and renunciation as well. The Bhagavad Pandit was about 70 or 75 years old and lived in a section of Kolkata called Bhatpara. He had been staring at Sri Ramakrishna with one pointed gaze when he suddenly said, You are a great soul. Ramakrishna, you can say that of Naharad, a Prahlad, a Shubhdev, and others like them, but I am like your own son. However, one can also say that in one sense the devotee is bigger than God because devotees always carry God in their hearts. All were filled with bliss on hearing these words. In Vaishnavism, a devotee may consider himself as large and as God and as small. Krishna's mother, Yashoda, bound her child Krishna with a cord so that he couldn't wander off to the other village families. You see, she believed that she alone knew best how to care for him. <laughs> Ramakrishna, sometimes God is like a magnet 
And sometimes the devotee is like a piece of iron. God irresistibly attracts the devotee. Sometimes the devotee is like a magnet and God is like a piece of iron. God is so attracted by the devotion, devotion of the devotee that he becomes intoxicated with his love and must himself rush to the devotee. Both are true. Sri Ramakrishna was ready to return to Dokshineshwar. In the parlor of the veranda, he turned to Isan and the others to give his last inspiring words. Ramakrishna, whoever can call on God, even in the midst of this life in the world, which is like an ocean overflowing with attachments and worldly relations, is most certainly a true devotee. Those who have renounced the world will, of course, call on me and serve me. What is the greatness in that? <laughs> if a renunciant doesn't call on me, others will speak disparagingly of him. He who calls on me even while living in the world is truly great. He is a hero. The Bhagavad Pandit. The same thing is written in the scriptures, sir. Once the meditation of a hermit sadhu was disturbed by the cawing of a crow. When the hermit looked in anger at the crow, the bird was at once burned to ashes. Feeling proud of his attainment, he went to beg his daily meal at the house of a pious woman whose custom it was to serve her husband as God himself. She served her husband day and night. When he came home from work, she washed his feet with water and dried them with her hair. When the sadhu arrived to beg his meal, she told him that she was cooking her husband's meal just now and that he would have to wait until she had finished. The sadhu was hot-tempered and at once cursed her with these words, There will be no welfare in this house. The devoted wife answered, Oh, Sadhu, I'm not a crow to be burned to ashes by your curse. You just wait a while and I will serve you as well. The Sadhu was astonished by this reply and at once became the woman's disciple. And another story, a story of a Brahmagyani was a butcher. In the day he sold meat, and after work he devotedly sell, served his elderly parents. A Brahmin seeker had heard that a sage of the highest attainment lived in that house, so he went there in search of enlightenment. The Brahmin was astonished and horrified to discover the profession of this knower of God. He thought, this man is a butcher who sells meat that has, he has killed and cut up himself. How can such a person lead anyone to enlightenment? In truth, the butcher was a great sage, and the Brahman became his disciple. Sri Ramakrishna was ready to sit in the carriage. The family of Ishan's father-in-law lived in the house next door and they were standing on the porch to hear Ramakrishna's parting words. Ramakrishna, live in the world like an ant. In this world, the eternal and the transitory are mixed together like sand and sugar. The ant is able to take only the sugar and leave the sand. Be like the swan. The true and the untrue are mixed together like milk and water. The swan is able to drink only the milk of divine bliss while leaving the water of worldly pleasures behind. Oh. On page 217, chapter 12, October 19th, 1884, Kolkata. The first discussion. Today, Sri Ramakrishna has come to attend the great autumn festival of the Sinti Brahma Samaj. 
It is the day after Kali Puja, the first day of the bright fortnight, the 19th of October, 1884. The festival is being held at the beautiful garden house of Beni Mada Paul, located in Sinti, about three miles north of Kolkata. Beni Paul, a Brahmo devotee, is present along with the whole assembly of the Brahmo Samad. Early in the morning, the congregation had completed their spiritual practices and performed their worship. Now, at about four o'clock in the afternoon, Sri Ramakrishna arrived. His carriage drove to the center of the garden and stopped. It was surrounded on four sides by the Brahmo devotees. He proceeded to the large assembly hall of the house where a platform had been arranged upon which he was to sit. He took his seat on the platform and leaned back against the wall next to the platform. On all sides were the devotees of the Samaj. Trilokya and Bijoy were present as well as a judge who was also a Brahmo member. It was a bright afternoon and many flags of various colors were flying. There was a lovely lake directly beyond the open doors of the hall, and in the garden, a fragrant breeze was blowing through the countless leaves on the trees. Even the bees seemed to be dancing about the flowers of the many fruit trees which grew throughout the garden. Everyone present felt a divine bliss in experiencing all this beauty and the company of the great saint of Dokshineshwar. All were thinking, today we will listen to the words of the Vedas from the mouth of Sri Ramakrishna. These are the same words of wisdom spoken by the Aryan rishis in ancient times to their disciples, who, hearing them, became illumined with the knowledge of Brahman, and all the pain of their lives vanished forever. They were filled with devotion. They became incarnations of devotion, just as the twelve disciples of Jesus were devoted to their master. Even the fish listened to, the, to those Vedic words of truth. They were all the same words that Krishna spoke to Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra as recorded in the Bhagavad Gita and to which Arjuna listened to with the greatest reverence. All the devotees felt that Sri Ramakrishna was about to speak to them in the same way that Krishna spoke to Arjun and the Vedic seers spoke to their disciples in ancient India. Sri Ramakrishna took his seat. He sat on the beautiful raised dais and gazed at the adoring devotees that surrounded him. On this dais, it was the custom of the Brahmos to give lectures and discussions on the subjects of the highest divinity. It seemed to the devotees that this place devoted to discussions about God and now graced by the presence of the great master from Dokshineshwar had become the convolution of all the holy places of pilgrimage. Trilokya began to sing.
mother, you are mad. Make me your devotee mad as well. Make me mad with pure divine love for you. I have no other karma remaining except to love you. Take me, your devotee, and submerge me in the ocean of your divine love. This world is a madhouse, a lunatic asylum. Some are laughing, some are crying, and some are dancing in bliss. Jesus, Chaitanya, and Muhammad were all mad with your love and danced in their madness. They became unconscious with love. When will I be so blessed? When will I dissolve and be lost in you forever? Just as the guru is, so is the disciple. Who can understand this play of love? You are the one who makes us mad. You are the epitome of madness. And you bless us with your love, and I am your servant in life after life. As Sri Ramakrishna listened to this song, he went into deep Bhav Samadhi. All his pranas merging into one, he went beyond the pranas and became one with the self. His organs of action and knowledge, his mind, intellect, and ego, all were transcended. Everything was erased, vanished. Only the body remained sitting there like an inner doll. Once Krishna entered such a state, it was at the end of the great war of Kurukshetra. As Bhishma lay dying on his bed of arrows, Krishna went into deep samadhi and Yunisthira and the Pandavas thought, now Krishna also will leave his body. And they began to cry. The second discussion. The Brahmo Samaj and meditation on the formless God. After some time of being in deep samadhi, Sri Ramakrishna returned to consciousness of the outer world and began speaking to the Brahmo devotees. It is extremely rare to see someone submerged in samadhi. At first, Ramakrishna's words were unclear, but as he regained normal consciousness, his speech became more coherent. He spoke in a state of divine love. Ramakrishna. Mother, I don't want to become one with the source of bliss. I want to enjoy bliss. Nor do I want occult powers. If a person has even one of the eight siddhis, that person will not find God. Krishna explained to Arjuna how to make oneself small or large at will. Then he said, if you see someone with even one of these powers, you may know that he will not attain to me. Why? Because with powers comes egotism. There is always much talk about one who is able to manifest occult power. And if even the smallest tail of the ego remains, God is unattainable. There are also devotees who spend a lot of time in conspicuous worship. They wear a mala in a prominent way, and they also put a big tilak on their forehead. <laughs> chee, chee, chee. <laughs> in various ways, they show others what great devotees they are, how far they have advanced. But if one truly wishes to go toward God, it is better show very little outwardly. A true devotee who sincerely wishes to have the vision of God calls on the divine from within. He repeats the name silently and his external manner is also very simple and unassuming. What is the state of one who has attained God? Without a doubt, when one knows that his soul is one with God and that God alone does everything, that one has seen God. 
When one has not only seen God, but communicated intimately with Him, then one can be said to have attained to God. Such a person will have a relationship of profound love. One will have the attitude of a child of God. Another, the attitude of a friend. Others, with a relationship of great sweetness, will commune with God. One person may have faith that there is fire in the wood. But another brings the fire out and cooks his rice and is nourished by that rice. These are two different things. One devotee knows that God exists, but the other is fully nourished, satisfied, and at peace. There is no end to the infinite manifestations of God. God comes to one who is sincere. Increase your faith. Continually call on him with sincerity. Feel the loving presence of God and you will realize him. Then, if it is your wish, you will attain to the formless God as well. To the Brahma devotee. Be fixed in your faith. Whether it be God with form or without form, you must be steady in your sadhana. Then when you receive God's grace, all your doubts will vanish. Those who have faith in God with form will have the vision of God, and those who believe in the formless God will also attain to Him. If you sprinkle sugar on bread, it will taste sweet. And if you throw away the bread and eat the sugar plain, it will also taste sweet. Oh, wow. <laughs> the main thing is to make your mind fixed, constant. You have to pray with great sincerity. When an ordinary devotee contemplates God, do you know what it is like? There is a fine gentleman strolling in the garden, and he picks a flower and says to his friends, Look, God has created such a lovely flower. This thought of God lasts only for an instant, like a drop of water on a hot frying pan. It evaporates immediately. Your faith and practice must be steady as well. If not, you will not be able to find the gems and jewels which lie on the bottom of the sea of love. If you just float on the surface, you will never find them. And saying this, Sri Ramakrishna began to sing a song that intoxicated all the devotees. Everyone understood, just as though they were sitting in Vaikut, listening to the words of Vishnu. Yes. 
The Brahma devotees and their exclusive worship of the transcendental, formless aspect of God study and true longing. Ramakrishna dive deep, learn to love God sincerely, become intoxicated with divine love. You see, I have heard about your worship, but why is it that you emphasize the formless aspect of God so much? Oh God, you made the heavens, you made the sky, you made the big ocean, you made the moon and the sun and the stars. You did everything. Why do you talk so much about all this? People come to this beautiful garden house and they say, oh, look at the trees, look at the flowers. What sort of pictures are hanging inside the house? Everyone is so impressed, but how many desire to meet the owner of the garden? Only two or three will go and search to the owner. If you search for God, you will find him. Make a relationship with God. Speak with Him. Just as I am speaking with you right now. Please. I'm telling you the truth. If you desire it, you will see God. But to whom can I tell these words? Who will believe me? If you study the scriptures, will that take you to God? By reading and studying Sanskrit, you will learn about grammar, the different meters, and so forth. But until you dive deeply, you will not see God. If you dive deep into true practice, God will let himself be known by you, and all your doubts will vanish. You may read a thousand scriptures and memorize ten thousand verses, but if you do not de dive deep with tremendous sincerity, you cannot hope to see God. Just being a pundit is not sufficient. A preacher can tell others about the existence of God, but he himself will not find God. What will you gain by collecting a lot of books and scriptures? Until you receive the grace of God, nothing will avail. God bestows his grace on those with whom he is pleased. Therefore, try with great sincerity to earn God's grace. When grace comes, you will have his vision and he will talk with you personally. A businessman. Sir, does God give his grace more uh, to one person than to others? If that is true, then God is just like a businessman. <laughs> Ramakrishna, what are you talking about? All belong to God, the horse is his and the pig is his. The great Bengali philosopher Vidyasagar said the same thing to me. He said, sir, does God give more power to one person than to another? I said to him that God is hidden within all beings. He dwells within me in the same way that he dwells within an ant. But some have a greater capacity to receive the divine power. If we were all the same and everyone were equal in regard to power, then why do we come to see you, Vidyasagar? Do you have two horns growing out of your head? Is that why we are here? That's not the reason. You are compassionate. You are intelligent. These are the qualities which have made you well known. That is why your name is famous in Bengal. There are some scholars who are able to defeat a hundred others in argument. And there are some who hear just one verse and run away. <laughs> If you do not have a special power, then why do so many people respect you and hold you in such high regard? This is also why people respect Kesham Sen so highly. In the Gita, it is written that when you see someone who is worthy of great respect because of his intellect or musical talent or ability to speak well in front of groups, you may know without a doubt that God has endowed him with a special power. Brahmo devotee to the businessman. You should listen carefully to what he is saying and accept it. Ramakrishna, 
displeased. What are you saying? What kind of person are you? Do you mean that without testing the truth of my words and becoming convinced, he should just accept them? People like you are likely to be deceived by a fraud. Don't accept so quickly. The Brahmo devotee felt very much embarrassed. Let's stop here and see if there are any questions. Yes, please. Swamiji, I have a question on page 207. Yes. At the bottom, uh, Sri Ramakrishna says, Anyani declares I am not the body. I have gone beyond hunger and thirst, pain and pleasure and so on. Absolutely. Uh, is there, how was, uh, uh, and he also talks about other paths like the path of devotion and karma. How is the body viewed by these people who follow the other paths? And I, I am a body. I am somebody and I have a body and I do have hunger and I do have thirst but when I remember you I'm filled with bliss. I serve you as a servant of God and I'm filled with bliss. But I have a body. I'm not a Gani. Gani is always in Samadhi. When he comes out of Samadhi he's hungry. He's no longer a Gani. <laughs> <laughs> he lost his gyan, he lost his boy Rajya because of the attachment to the body. A bhakta says, hey, I'm hungry, mom, but you're my mom and I know you'll feed me. I come at the right time for my meals. That's a devotee. I'm not going to make you wait. Are there other questions? Swamiji, question from Nanda from San Jose. Namaste, Nanda Ma. Pranam Ma and Swamiji, is it best to follow only one form of yoga and ignore other paths? For example, is it okay for me to perform karma yoga alone and ignore bhakti and jnana as I do not have a natural inclination for these yogas? Thank you. Nanda Ma, you cannot perform karma yoga without bhakti. It is impossible. We speak of them as different paths, only so we can intellectually understand them. But without devotion, what yoga will you achieve? How will you even think to serve selfless, selflessly? Without Gan, what karma will you perform? Without knowledge, what are you going to do? So all three are inseparably interconnected. So. If you have a preponderance of karma to perform at any one time, you can say, I'm performing my karma as a service to my guru and to God. And I'm feeding the family that God has given to me and trusted to my care because I want to serve God as efficiently and lovingly and devotedly as possible. But not without devotion. Question from Nilima from New Delhi. Namaste Nilima. Namaste mind Swamiji. What if one has a deep desire to attain God but many handicaps towards getting the discipline? Is it destiny or past karma which create blocks? Don't worry about how long it takes to get there or how many obstacles you have to overcome. Just feel the privilege of getting to make the journey. Enjoy the privilege of being able to overcome those obstacles and circumvent those obstacles and find the way to endear yourself to God and find a way to increase God's endearment to you. That should be sufficient. Your cup is half full, it's not half empty. <laughs> and always remember that. Well, how privileged you are to be a devotee of God. How privileged you are in this day to have a true guru, a true example who inspires you and communicates directly with you. <laughs> this is a privilege how many of us long for. Question from Eric from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Namaste, Eric. Pranam Ma and Swamiji, I have read a lot about how Sri Ramakrishna was pining for his devotees to come. 
Can you please share what it is like, the bhava of pining for devotees to come? What did Sri Ramakrishna feel? Thank you. Oh, <laughs> I certainly can share with you <laughs> what it's like to pine for true devotees to come and actually be devoted and want to really change their lives. I can tell you very much what it's like, but you don't want to listen to my rant. <laughs> Question from Devi from Atlanta. Namaste Devi Ma. Namaste Swamiji. How do we earn God's grace? Kripa. What you do is what you get. The grace is Kripa. And now earning the grace means doing more sadhana and doing everything that you do as a sadhana and earning the grace by cultivating your relationship with God, by doing more puja, by reading the scriptures, by studying and meditating and doing all the things that Ramakrishna says won't take you to God but they will take you away from your e little ego eye and its insignificant attachments to worldliness. And that's a big step. So take, be content with small gains. Take that big step. Question from Kumari from Valley Hill. Namaste Kumari Mom. Thakur Ramakrishna mentions that if we have that intensity of feeling for God, then no matter what path we choose, we have achieved everything. How to develop more devotion and that intensity of feeling for God? Just think of what happens when you have a terrible catastrophe and a horrible financial loss. How do you cry? Just think how much more if we cry for God in the same way as we cry for the loss of our attachments. So how do we cultivate that relationship every day, whether we need it or not? Every day we come and we spend some time in, a, in, in, a, in the presence of a divine spirit. Make a place, a meeting place where you meet God and prepare everything for God to come because it, it, she will. You will realize God if you make a place to meet God and make that place as beautiful as you possibly can because she, you don't want to say, God, my house is a mess. I've invited you over. Here's the broom and here's the dustpan. Please clean it up for me. You want to say, God, I've got it all shining and ready for you. I'm waiting for your arrival. Everything's prepared just like Srima told me to do. It shines and glistens and it's sparkling clean. And I give you the highest respect and I want to pay exclusive attention to you. And then she'll come. Question from Wendy from New Jersey. Namaste. Uh, on page 192, Sri Ramakrishna says, Oh God, you are the doer, I do nothing at all. Can you please explain this in relation to free will? Why do we spend so much time pondering over decisions if it's all God's will? Well, when you are such a devotee, then Wendy, your, your will and God's will are in attunement, in alignment. They are going in the same direction. And that's the objective. We are spending so much time contemplating what would be the best outcome or the best decision because we think that it's our decision and I'm attached to the outcome and I want it my way. And I want to give the least and I want to get the most. God, if you're a compassionate God, fulfill my desire. Uh, mother would like to change your name. <laughs> Om Sam Saraswati Namaha. Namaste.